Okay, welcome to the Cyber Senate Industrial Defender OT Data Webinar. My name is James Nesbitt. I'm the director and founder of the Cyber Senate. We'll give it just a few more minutes as people trickle in, um, but I did want to try and kick us off and, and get started uh, on time as we have a lot to talk about today. This webinar is going to discuss operational technology data. Uh, critical infrastructure companies have multiple operational technology security data personas that help ensure the safety and security of their ICS assets. That's plant managers, IT operations, uh, compliance offices, SOC analysts, and executive level teams all consume OT security data differently and have a common goal of ensuring that IT, excuse me, that OT ICS assets are secure. So today we have Industrial Defender and Gray Matter joining us in a webinar hosted here by the Cyber Senate for a discussion around the different types of personas that consume OT data and how they process that data differently. Um, we've been talking a lot on our conferences recently about data, its role, uh, it's how we can use it uh, to create a more resilient infrastructure, how it can be utilized and operationalized is, is one of the key topics as well as how we can operationalize data for threat intelligence. So when Industrial Defender came to us and wanted to talk a little bit more about OT data, we were certainly happy to hear about it and we're looking forward to today's uh, discussion. Uh, these experts today are going to discuss what the most valuable pieces of data to collect are and why, how to navigate or, excuse me, integrate OT data into enterprise systems, uh, how different people within your organization use OT data, and use cases for energy, water, and transportation sectors. Um, so, to introduce some of our experts that will be joining us today, we have Greg Valentine, who's the Senior Vice President of Solutions Engineering at Industrial Defender. And we have Scott Christensen, who's the Cyber Practice Director over at Gray Matter. Throughout today's uh, webinar, we will also be asking several questions and launching a few polls. So if uh, everyone would get involved, that would certainly help us. Uh, to make more informed decisions moving forward on how we can, how we as a, a sector can uh, better facilitate resilience uh, in cybersecurity, and of course, uh, help uh, Gray Matters and Industrial Defender understand what your needs are. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand the MC over to Greg and Scott Christensen, Greg Valentine, Scott Christensen, over to you folks. Great, thank you. Um, thank you hi, much. everyone. My name is Greg. I'll, I'll go first, if you don't mind, Scott. Uh, as was just said, I'm the Senior VP of Solutions Engineering over at Industrial Defender. I started my cybersecurity journey around 20-ish years ago at a small company in Austin, Texas called Sys Internals. Since then, I've been working for companies such as Lockheed Martin, Capgemini, and Industrial Defender. Um, I've been focusing on the OT cybersecurity world now for the past eight-ish years and happy to be here. Scott? Thanks, Greg. Yeah, Scott Christensen here. I'm the cybersecurity practice director for Gray Matter. Uh, very similar to Greg, I started my journey a little over 20 plus years ago in cybersecurity. Uh, I kind of fell into it because of where I live. I live in Houston, Texas, and anyone who knows about the city of Houston knows uh, we've got one dominant industry, and therefore pretty much everything got revolved around OT and OT security. Uh, previous to Gray Matter, I was with GE Digital as their subject matter expert on cybersecurity and worked with a number of different places like Schlumberger and a few others that really uh, aligned myself with understanding kind of what are the operational best practices for cybersecurity. Thanks, Greg. Excellent. So um, as was said earlier, we're gonna run through a few slides that cover OT data. I tend to focus on the cybersecurity side of things. So I'm gonna have this uh, cybersecurity bent to the different slides. So, uh, but between Scott and myself, hopefully we have a good conversation and hopefully there's some good information here that everyone can, can glean something from. Um, What's interesting about this, this deck for me is that it kind of 
brings cybersecurity and mixes it with kind of the theory of relativity. And, and I don't mean Einstein here. I mean, basically your perspective on cybersecurity is specific to the role that you have within the organization. And we'll go through some of these roles in the deck here and, and talk about uh, how your perspective of cybersecurity is absolutely valid, absolutely critical, but it's looking across all the different uh, roles to give you a complete foundational uh, glimpse or view into what cybersecurity may be in your OT environment. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that that's kind of the key component. I think we, we always hear philosophies about everybody plays a role in security, and uh, I, but I think this really kind of shines a light on the perspective everyone's role has in cybersecurity. You know, what what are you trying to get out of the data that's important to you? It's going to be very reflective of the role uh, that you know, you're trying to achieve. So I think that's really what we're trying to accomplish here is understanding uh, everyone have a, a good view into what other people uh, might have as a priority to understand how we can work together from a cybersecurity perspective. Exactly. And just keep in mind, everyone's perspective is completely valid. Everybody has their own role in the organization. Uh, but looking at it broadly, it gives us, you know, get, just getting exposed to everyone's perspective, I think will help bring everyone together a little bit more, which is great. Absolutely. Um, so again, my bent is going to be focusing on OT cybersecurity configuration data. So asking questions like, um, you know, what do you have in place today? What changes are occurring within your OT plant site? Uh, and change could be good. It doesn't necessarily mean bad, maybe planned maintenance. Can you document everything that was changed depending on the sector that you may be in? That might be a requirement. It might be part of your compliance needs to be able to document everything that's going on within, the, within that plant site, for example. What local accounts do you have in all your systems? What are their privilege levels within all of those systems? Are they changing? Or are they not? What ports do you have open on the network on that particular, on all of your different endpoints? What software, what versions of software do you have and what vulnerabilities do you have in place? Because you may very well have old outdated software within the OT infrastructure. Uh, these are just some of the, the challenges configuration wise that you need to worry about in order to have a proper uh, view on the state of your, your overall uh, cybersecurity posture, I would say. Yeah, and I, and I think the other is, is also the extension of automating the data collection to make it more efficient, us doing our jobs, right? The same way we automate all of our other processes, we can automate a lot of our security functions yeah. and really leverage that automation to do more with less is the best way to put it. Hmm. Right, you're more efficient, which is absolutely a goal for, that everyone has, but mm -hmm. not only that, you're always working with the most current up-to-date set of data, right? You always Absolutely. know what the current state of the union is, which is key. <laughs> and frankly, automation helps take that human error out of the equation a little bit. Absolutely. That certainly is a reality. So one thing that I like to talk about a little bit here is, is safety within the plants. Now, mm -hmm. safety is always job one for everyone within a, an OT environment. We have been talking, for those of us in the cybersecurity world in the OT space, about the correlation between safety and cybersecurity. And this, is, this has been talked about for a while now, but it's really beginning to resonate now. It, basically, the problem that we come up with, that we have, is I can tell you that an unsecure site is less safe than a secure site, I, but it's very challenging to qualify that or quantify that, right? But what are the risks associated with not having uh, visibility in the security stance of your OT infrastructure? I would say absolutely has a, an impact on the overall safety of, the, of that plant. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the component that we most I wouldn't say often overlooked, but I think it's very often, you know, it's one of those things we may not as value much is the fact that the big difference between IT and OT systems is that physical component that, yeah. you know, we always, we always talk about cyber physical, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where I'm getting a machine to do a physical action through a digital signal and, and making sure that the appropriate physical action occurs. 
Uh, you can go back all the way through the history of the early OT attacks. Uh, you can even go back as far as like 1983 with the Trans-Siberian uh, pipeline explosion, right? Where uh, safety thresholds were taken off. And you could really just see the history of attacks on this is the, it's, this, it's the physical component is what we're really trying to protect. So if you don't attach that to safety, uh, right. you're running a different kind of risk. And I think that's the important criticality difference between traditional IT and OT systems, right? Is that that safety component should be the number one priority along with availability and the other th the other priority stack. The other triad, right? The rest of the triad. Yeah, we, yeah, we all I, know the triad, yep. <laughs> exactly, and, and, and safety is core to the culture of, of mm -hmm. the industrial control system world, right? All that I think we're trying to say is that security is an element, it is a property, it is a, a variable in that equation of trying to minimize risk to the safety of the, you know, the fiscal process that we have to, to, yep. to manage over time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, so as far as the configuration data goes and that information that we were talking about automating the collection of and processing and correlating exact, uh, et cetera, this will give you visibility to uh, blind spots that you may have within your organization. Um, the, the very act of having this webinar today where we're talking about the different roles within the organization and how they view cybersecurity, hopefully this will facilitate communication between the different uh, roles within, within the, the organization. That, Cause that's, that's really how everybody can move forward uh, is, is, is through this communication. Yeah, um, we, we all know the dirty word convergence, right? That's uh, <laughs> right. Everyone, everyone knows the dirty little ITOD yeah. convergence. Everyone has sat through the different conferences and we've all sat through the different, how do we overcome that challenge, right? And I, th I think I think that's exactly what we're trying to promote here is that communication breakdown and understanding that while at the end of the day, we may have different views, our priorities are still at the end of the day the same, right? How do we protect a critical infrastructure? How do we protect our operations? How do we protect the revenue side of our business, right? You know, all those are kind of key functions that everybody shares that responsibility. They just want to do it from a different lens and understanding that if we open up those communications, it becomes really critical uh, for kind of achieving that, that dirty little convergence word. Absolutely. And the convergence is, is <laughs> it is actually happening. Everyone sees it. Everybody is talking about it. But, you know, the, the enterprise side, they have to look, they have to manage revenue, right? And the revenue usually is coming from the OT plants of some sort, power generation, oil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, the, the inevitability is this free flowing of communication. So embrace that, I guess, is, is my, yeah. is my uh, tint. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I always use the term, you know, the best security programs is when security stops being seen as the disabler and, and into the enabler of things, right? The, the, you, when you have that mindset, security is always the guys that make it harder for me to do my job. Right. That becomes a big challenge, right? That's why communication breaks down. That's why you don't see the IT, OT convergence because they just see security, the guys that tell me I can't do things. Right. Uh, when you and start seeing it, when you start seeing that pivot to security being the guys that help me do things in a different way or do in a way that's less risky, then it becomes a, a much more, you know, proactively, you know, symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Historically security, just as Scott said, it was, work, it was, <laughs> you're introducing change into my environment that's fully automated and everything's running great. Change equals risk. Risk is bad. So therefore security is bad. And in yeah. reality, if you look at it a little differently, where these, these capabilities are being added to help protect and maintain the safety of the physical plant. That's just a different perspective, I guess, is the way to put it. Absolutely. All right. So these are the different roles that we're going to be looking at today on the, on the webinar, compliance officer, IT operations, SOC analyst, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody, everybody has a part to play in this, orchestration, I guess, uh, in order to move the company forward, right? Mm -hmm. But everybody has their own lens, as Scott and I have been saying, on how they view their perspective of the uh, organization and how to move the organization forward. So I believe we're going to have a, a poll quickly, uh, if you guys don't mind letting us know this will be interesting just so that we can customize and kind of tailor the talk. Uh, we want to make sure, um, see, 
what the audience is made up of today. Yeah, and I think we're also curious to see, you know, who's engaged in security, because I think sometimes right. we always want to think it's the, you know, the traditional roles, but I think we're finding more and more uh, it's it's people that you would not normally think of as security people are engaging in security conversations. And I think it's, I want to see if we got a little bit of knowledge yeah. in that, if that's what we're seeing, that expansion really occur. Yeah. Good coffee break excuse too. <laughs> it's a win-win. There you go. Also, while this poll is is active, just a you know, reminder: there's a there's a a window or a button. I'm not sure which, <laughs> where questions can be submitted, and once once they're submitted, we'll uh, be, do our best to respond and give you our perspective on whatever questions you may have or issues, etc. Yeah, please please make this interactive. We'd love exactly. we'd love questions. Yeah. Uh, as Please. much and Greg and I want to become close friends, you know, we're happy to have other people join the conversation. So feel free to jump in with any questions y'all might have. Okay. All right. I'm not sure how much longer we'll keep that open. I think we can probably move on. If you guys think think we're done with that that poll, mm -hmm. can you can That's everyone right. see it? Right, yeah. everyone have a chance to vote out there. Looks like about eighty seven percent participated. Um, That's good. I'm, yeah. I've got a colleague logged in here as well. It looks like we, I mean, hopefully everyone can see the the results of this. Um, so we'll go ahead and end this poll. And again, like like uh, uh, Greg and Scott said, folks, um, use the the Q and A function and use the chat function as well. We're here uh, to answer your questions and now's a great time to ask them. So I'll go ahead and end this poll, folks. Excellent. There we go. A pretty good spread, it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. This is, this is actually ideal in my mind because mm -hmm. now we we can cover all the different roles and everyone uh, can learn a little bit about, uh, about each other. Could have used one plant manager guy. So, you know, no, just kidding. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, let's, let's move on. Perfect. So the plant engineer, right? This is, this is literally where the rubber meets the road, right? The, mm -hmm. the plant engineer is continually focusing on, Plant pr production, efficiencies, safety, of course, quality of the output. Um, I've already talked a little bit about safety and security, so I'm not going to go down that uh, <laughs> road again. But this is an example of someone that it's historically, you know, they're proud of their baby, I guess is the way to put it, right? <laughs> they, they have everything running exactly the way that they should be running. They tweak it a little bit here, a little bit there to get the formula just right, but everything is running and humming along beautifully. And they're really not thinking about what if, what if somebody breaches, what if ransomware gets in, things along those lines. So uh, that's, a, that's a concern. Absolutely, and I, and I think, the two things I always take away from the, the engineers is one is they love static. If it's not broke, don't change it. You know, they love that. They love that mindset. If it's, you know, it, it give me normal because normal means everything's working as expected. Yeah. And the, the second thing that they also, uh, the challenge I think they also see is the aging of their systems. And I think this is a lot of times people don't realize that they have a 20 to 25 year technology lifespan on the average plant floor. So when you look at that, you're supporting that breadth of you know generational technologies, 
-hmm. you kind of have to be a, a little bit of everything, right? You got to be a little bit of a serial guy. You got to be a little bit of a network guy. You've got to be a little bit of a controls engineer. You got to be, you got so many different hats that you've got to wear because of that breadth of technology that a lot of times they, they struggle with the communications from the traditional enterprise who comes in and thinks that the life cycle is three to five years, right? Well, we replace everything every three years, no big deal. Whereas I could have a PLC control that's 20, 25 years old, right next to something I bought last week. And yeah. they're always considering out, how do I maintain uh, that uptime, that that maintenance window, right? That's their, their main focus, right? Is anything that's unplanned downtime is a bad, bad thing for them. And so I always look at it when you, their biggest focus from a security perspective as an extension of their safety and maintenance programs. Yeah. That's really what they focus on, right? Is cyber is just an extension of how do I keep the lines going and how do I focus on that? They, they, they don't care about a lot of the more traditional threat vectors. They don't care about a lot of that. That's not really their focus. They're focused on what's going to take my line down and can I prevent it? Can I put controls in place to get ahead of potential impactful events? Couldn't have said anything. Absolutely right. I mean, I completely agree. It's, you know, the, the 2025 life you know, window that they operate under is the antithesis of, a, of an enterprise IT cybersecurity person who's continually doing, well, well, we'll talk about IT operations a little bit later, <laughs> but, you know, they're always patching, they're always uh, mitigating vulnerabilities uh, via via enhancements or software upgrades or, you know, this constant churn of change and all of that constant churn of change to better improve the security of the IT side, of course, is not the best well laid out planned way of uh, securing the OT environment. These are just two fundamentally different uh, yep. environments. And, and, and security professionals out there, uh, the, the yeah. first thing, if your recommendation is, I'll just go patch it, you're, you're immediately going to disconnect right. from the plan engineer. You're uh, immediately it, going to be walked off the side. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Why, do, uh, why don't you just patch it, right? Well, that's uh, the fact that their systems are so intertwined and because of the age and breadth of their systems, a simple patch could break multiple things. You get this cascading risk yeah. to, uh, uh, just deploy, deploying a patch that there's a validation method. It's, it's much more riskier for them to patch. Uh, and to them, if they're down because they applied a patch that broke some customizable configuration or they're down from a cyber event, it's the same problem. So they, they don't see that as, uh, as a benefit to just, oh, let me just go patch things. Yeah, uh, just getting, uh, sorry, just getting a list of patches appropriate for your endpoints is not enough. Are those, are those patches approved by the OEM vendor, right? There's, absolutely. There's a whole series. It's just a different process altogether. Yeah, and a comment from the chat is exactly right, right? The time it takes to, to you know, to uh, actually yes. deploy, validate, get a patch, it is it is an extensive effort. So when you say just go patch it, you're basically saying okay. ignore all the rest of the five, six hats you wear and focus okay. on this one thing, despite the fact that your real job is to keep the line going, right? To keep production moving, keep all those things, focus on all those things. And that's absolutely Right. A patching program is just fundamentally different in OT from, from IT. And not in a in a, a mature enterprise IT side, you know, there are it's it's an extensive project even on the enterprise side. But Absolutely. move that to a static OT environment and everything, everything's different. And and here's a great question. Uh, can we use data to manage risk faster? Stop relying on just on patching. I, I, that's an absolute great question. So the answer is yes. There's a lot of things we can use from data. And I'll give you a perfect example of where automation and data can really help out is almost every one of these plan engineers has an Excel sheet. On this Excel sheet, it's all my IP addresses, my MAC addresses, my, my device types, the manufacturer, all those basic asset inventory information. And every honest plan engineer will tell you that is out of date and never kept up because it's the first thing that falls by the wayside. When you look at any kind of security problem, the, 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 the first program you build out is identify, right? Knowing all your assets, knowing what they are. So the first thing the plan engineer tells you is I try to keep it up to date, never do. The security guy says, hey, this is the best way to start a program. So finding a way to automate that process is immediately gonna free up a bunch of time. It's also gonna let me to identify where I can apply environment environmental changes because I know where I'm impacted by risk. And I think it's uh, the key component to a plan engineer. If I can say, and I'll just pick on log4j just because it's a nice easy one and everyone's fairly familiar with it over the last few months. Mm -hmm. When I get a release from my vendors as log4j impacted these three types of devices, I can go to my Excel sheet that's out of date and kind of guess where they those devices might live. 
or I go to an automated solution that says, this is exactly where you're impacted. And okay. then I can engage what my protection program needs to look like. So using that data to quickly just diagnose where I'm impacted is going to be, is absolutely to the plan engineer's favor. Yeah. I mean, of all the cybersecurity programs that can be put in place, start with the basics, the blocking and tackling. What do I have? How are they configured? What's on those systems today? And maintain that over time. Because even though change doesn't occur nearly as quickly in the OT space as it does in the IT space, it does happen. And visibility into that in environment and visibility into what's going on from a configuration standpoint is key. So you wanna make sure that the data is accurate. You wanna make sure it's up to date. And, and I think there's an there's a inherent value to that static nature though too. I can create what is normal in my environment mm -hmm. and alert me to abnormal. You know, that well, alone, there's a value I can do in that. You know, the simplest one I can think of is I shouldn't have IPs just show up randomly on my network. I don't have DHCP. I don't have a lot of those, those dynamic natures in my OT network. So mm -hmm. if a new IP shows up, I need to know immediately, you know, I, that, that change to static nature, I can take advantage of that from a security perspective as an OT engineer, because I don't want change. So if change occurs, I need to make sure that this is change that's beneficial to the environment, not malicious. Right. Right. It's Either way, it's all about visibility, right? If you don't know, then it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Well, it does matter, but you know, you have to first gain that eyes on task, eyes on what's actually happening. And then the human brain kicks in. Now you can figure out, is this good? Is it bad? Is it something I need to remediate? How would I remediate it? Do I mitigate it, et cetera? Do I just document the problem? What happened? Exactly. Yeah. And then new question, how do we differentiate white noise from actionable okay. data? That's everybody's favorite question. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll take my first whack at it. And then I want Greg to kind of uh, sanity check me and correct me because I'm almost positive we're going to have a, a slightly di you know, differing of view on this. But to me, uh, the, the white noise, when you start with any system you deploy, you're going from seeing almost nothing that's happened on your network to every action on your network. So when you see that white noise, the reason is that volume of behavior that you've never seen before, you get overwhelmed, right? So I think the, the, first, the first process in my mind is establish a baseline of what normality is yeah. and then start creating the alerts and the the system of record for what's the what are the abnormal behaviors I need to know. So do I necessarily want to know every time someone changes a value within a, a tag in an HMI? Eh, probably don't. But do I want to see it when it exceeds a certain threshold? I probably do. So start establishing those and that allows you to take the 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 hundred percent of white noise down to 10% of valuable data, right? So you start refining that process and it's truly a tuning exercise. When you start deploying visibility tools, the deployments, uh, I hate to say this because it's probably going to get, is the easy part. It's the tuning that's the challenge. <laughs> right? And the De tuning is where you have to have a human brain involved. Exactly. Right? Every, every site's going to be unique and different in its own way and fashion. You need to have somebody with the experience of that particular site looking at the data. There's going to be a, a lot of data at first, uh, and but basically normalizing what is mm -hmm. what is normal within that environment allows you to build that baseline that Scott was just talking about. Once you have that baseline of, of normalcy, it's much easier to get that uh, you know out of band or uh, out of mm -hmm. out of norm. I'm saying yeah. normal 10 times. Abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Abnormal activity. And that's what you're really after. So right, do the the time investment up front, get the tuning exactly the way that you want to and different tools have different ways and techniques to do the tuning that's you know, mm -hmm. but it's critical otherwise you're going to see a lot of white noise and then it's going to all turn into white noise in your in your mind and you you're not going to be able to recognize bad unusual activity from good unusual activity and it's just you know, nobody benefits from that exactly So the plant manager is a little bit different than the plant engineer. The plant manager is responsible for maintaining compliance for the site. Um, most compliance regulations require documented and set uh, policies and procedures in place in order to better uh, secure the environment. Honestly, most of my compliance rules that I deal with are all around cybersecurity. So that's, that's the perspective that Greg is bringing <laughs> to this conversation. Um, the idea is to, Provide a basic compliance is not the same as security, but if you don't have compliance or regulations, 
would you be at least coming up to that minimum level of cybersecurity protection? I don't know. So all we know is that compliance is a requirement more or less in most sectors, not all sectors. Uh, and the idea is that it gives you a basic level of cybersecurity protection within the environment. So the plant manager is worried about what policies and procedures do we have in our 200 page document of that 200 page document that dictates, you know, for the HMIs, blah, 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 for the PLCs, uh, they have to be at Purdue level, you know, whatever. Again, each site's <laughs> gonna be a little bit unique. Um, but how does that document actually represent reality of the plan, right? So I might have a, you know, password password settings, right? A password has to be complex. It can't be older than 90 days, et cetera, et cetera. Different compliance, different rules, et cetera. Um, but how does, how does that policy that's in a document represent the reality of the environment inside of that plan? And that's, that's where, um, that's the challenge I think that plant managers have to worry about. Absolutely. And I, and I absolutely think that's also the plant managers, the role that is the first role where you start understanding what are we willing to accept from a risk standpoint. It's the first role that starts saying these, you know, for compliance is a perfect example. And I, I always pick on one specific subset of a compliance. I always think of uh, backups, right? I can have the greatest backups in the world. I can be doing them nightly. I can be doing them offsite. All these great processes I've got in place. From a compliance standpoint, it doesn't exist if I don't document it too, right? I fail almost every standard out there. If I do all the backups, I do all the process, but I don't document it, I still fail from a compliance standpoint. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It doesn't mean I don't have a business continuity. It just means because it's documented, not planned, I don't I don't achieve compliance. But, it do, but from a perspective of a plant manager, have I mitigated that risk? So that's, that's a, a, a decision each plant manager, I, I'd say, has their own perspective of, What's that acceptance level? But this is really the first place where you start seeing a decision on what I'm willing to accept from a risk standpoint. Uh, we can go back to our patching conversation, right? I know some plant managers that every maintenance window, everything they focus on is getting everything patched because that's the downtime that allows them to do it. And I know some plant managers that never accept the the, the patching risk and go de right. you know decade plus. And it's this is really where it becomes the decision of what we're willing to accept and what we're willing to move forward with. Agreed. The compliance team. <laughs> so this, this group, it's dedicated to achieving and maintaining industry compliance, right? That means they have to be prepared and they're continually preparing for the upcoming inevitable audit that's, that's on its way, <laughs> right? How do I get my documentation in order so that I can just hand it over to the auditor, let the auditor run through everything, check their check boxes, et cetera, and, and basically give you a passing grade at the end of the, at the, end of the mm -hmm. audit. So you have to not only document everything, but you have to prove that the integrity of the documentation is, 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 is pristine uh, as well. So it's a, it's a challenge um, for, for this role, honestly. And, and I think a lot of times, depending on the industry too, these are the guys that have to map what happens on the ground floor to what maps to a standard or a regulation, right? They, they have to take, if happens at A, this is what it means to B. And so they spend so much of their time understanding how do I connect the dots between the data I've collected and how it applies to the regulations and standards I'm trying to comply to. And I think uh, the, the, the key for a compliance conversation a lot of times is understanding the, the mandates that they're under and the standards that they're trying to adhere to. So for example, in power regulation, obviously I'm gonna, in North America, we're gonna focus on NERC SIP. Okay. Uh, and NERC SIP has quite a few, few nuanced controls in place that are unique to power generation. So knowing, understanding what those are and understanding how those map, that's really the compliance driver is how we meet, are we meeting our regulatory requirements? Can I map the answers I get from an audit to those regulatory requirements? And can I trust the data that I've gotten into that it's going to be accurate? And I think when you look at those categories, that's really where their, their main focus is going to be on is making sure they can achieve and connect those dots.
IT operations. So <laughs> I said earlier that we would be talking about IT operations and, and here we go. So um, best of intentions, right? IT operations responsible for patching systems, monitoring and managing configuration change over time, vulnerabilities, detecting vulnerabilities as quickly as possible so that they can do the appropriate mitigation, backing backups, making sure the backups are working, that they're going off site on a regular basis, all the normal um, IT type work that is being done on the enterprise side in order to make sure that the enterprise is more resilient, more secure, more able to protect itself from the inevitable bad guys that are out there. OT, of course, that are, you know, on, on the OT side, we're looking at that and we're saying, whoa, that's a lot of change you're doing there. That's not, that's not going to work. It's just, <laughs> it's just antithetical to, to work on the OT side of things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when I look at the, the struggles with IT operations, working with OT, the, the couple of things that really stand out for me as common challenges is from a from a best practices standpoint it operations is probably 10 to 15 years ahead of ot mm -hmm. you know things that it operations considers remedial are just now being introduced into ot security you know so so when you look at that perspective a lot of times there's a struggle with why aren't you doing it the way we do it on the enterprise and well because we we, we you know we only introduced networking 20 years ago you guys have had networking for 40 years i mean it's yeah. things like that and then the other is understanding that the shift in our focus on protocols becomes a challenge too. Most of the protocols we focus that ethernet is just a transport mechanism. And I think it's a lot of times there's a, a challenge that if I do all the tools that work in IT that focus very heavily on understanding the TCP IP stack, don't necessarily apply well when I go over to, you know, formerly serialized protocols now using Ethernet strictly as a transport mechanism. So if I'm only looking at the components that focus on the enterprise side, I'm missing a lot of my threats and not understanding the operational environments that are behind. But on top of that, when I look at those kind of as a whole, when I put the mandates and standards that have worked in IT and I try to apply them to OT without making adjustments or making considerations for the differences, that's where I see the big disconnect. Most often when I try to, and I, I always can pick on the one simplest one I always love is USB sticks. <laughs> it's the it's the bane of every IT operations guy's existence. They push very hard not, not to allow them, but you go tell an OT operator, I'm not gonna allow any more USB sticks. Yeah. And, you, and after the laughter subsides, you'll find out that most of the way things move around configuration changes, programmatic updates are through USB stick. And so you're really trying to make a, a philosophical change for something you think is just a policy enforcement. And that's always a lot of times where I see a lot of the disconnects is trying to understand that there's a philosophical approach difference. It's not just we do it this way because we want to, we do it this way because we have to. This is a focus of what we do and understanding that it's not by choice. Of all the roles we're talking about today, this is the one that I I, I have a lot of compassion for, but, and, but this is the role that that honestly would benefit the most from open communication, right? Mm -hmm. Typically there's a keep them at arm's length, don't interact. But in reality, the IT operations person is wanting what is best for the organization. They mm -hmm. were trying their best to secure the environment. They just don't typically have a good understanding of, of the OT space. Um, so this is, this is a good opportunity to communicate with them and educate them. And education is the key word here, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that a known vulnerability may be in an OT environment and that it may be consciously determined to leave that vulnerability there and, doc and only document it until the next maintenance window in six to 12 months <laughs> and then we'll remediate it. I mean, that will take an op IT operator's head and make it spin. But that's okay. That they need to understand why and how, and 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 that's all. So that in the future, they'll be prepared. They'll know. They'll understand. They'll they'll have a the context that they need for the OT space. Absolutely, and I I I, I think the word I'd use for IT operators a lot of times is empathy, because yeah, you know, uh, you know ten years ago, you know, really, everything below that that OT firewall, that perimeter boundary, was a black hole to them. Right, that wasn't their their purview. They weren't told not to touch it. It's not their infrastructure. Stay away. Not your role. 
then as we started to see a modernization efforts, you know, industry 4.0, digital transformation, we can all throw our buzz terms of the day, but really modernization efforts occur. What we, what we quickly saw was all of a sudden that black hole disappeared. You know, hey, I need someone who understands routing. I need to understand someone who understands policy configurations. I need someone, well, that person's in IT. And all of a sudden that black hole has been opened up and the infrastructure that they have to support doubled, tripled, quadrupled in size overnight. But they tried to apply what they been, what they knew worked and they, they've been given an almost impossible task to try to apply what worked in enterprise to the OT overnight, right? And we're talking, this only started occurring, what, five, 10 years ago, really, we started seeing that blended IT operations person working in the OT, trying to get visibility, trying to deploy security controls down to OT. That only started to happen fairly recent in, a, in the technology life cycle. Yeah, yeah. I see we have a question. What is the interaction between physical security, information security, personnel security, and cybersecurity? <laughs> so <laughs> I'll give you my perspective and Scott, you know, Please. feel free to chime in. Um, they are all aspects of security, first and foremost, absolutely. So physical security, um, gates, cameras, um, uh, cabinets that are locked, things like that. Absolutely a critical thing to keep people from walking off the street and entering your substation and just poking around and killing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, information security is similar to what we're talking about today in the sense that the OT data, that information that uh, can be configured to open things up too much or close things off too much, et cetera. The, the, so that's absolutely security. Personnel security, I think, if I'm, I'm guessing here, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this would be like an insider threat type of a situation where you want to have background checks on people who have access to the process and, and things along those lines. There are, again, compliance regulations that require this for depending on which industry you happen to be in. And cybersecurity, cybersecurity is a, a kind of a mixture of all of those. So all of those different things, fiscal security, information, personnel security, all fall under NERC SIP, for example, for power generation for North America. Um, and, and cybersecurity is kind of mixed in with all of that in, in my mind. So yeah, I 100% I, I, I agree. And I think when you look at, when, when we go to do a, an audit or an assessment of an, of an environment, I think the, the aspect that most surprises, because we're OT organization and we focus very heavily on OT security, but the aspect that I think most surprises when we come to do our audit is we'll ask, what happens when someone gets let go? What's mm -hmm. your pro process for de de you know, deprovisioning their systems? You know, the, people don't always think about that, that. And I think that's a mixture of, right? It's, did you disconnect their key card access? Did you turn off their admin access to, to systems? Th those are all things we want to find out, which is kind of a, an HR function, which I consider kind of the personnel security, right? right? I think those are all attached to, but we're also looking for, you know, key card, their physical access, the, you know, we're looking at their cyber access, we're looking at all those are components. And I, I think we're starting to see a shift in the, in the role. And I think we're starting to see when we when CISO stopped dropping the I out of their name, they're just becoming CSOs. We're starting to see that it's all related to one relationship, right? It's all security is so intertwined that, that we really need to make sure that there's, and it comes back to the same theme, right? The communication aspect. When someone gets let go, did we communicate this to the the you know admin team that they need to remove their access? Did we tell the security guys they don't need their key card anymore? That's all interaction. It's that communication aspect. And when we blend that role into a true CSO, then we start to see that be, be successful. Yeah, and this, this also goes back to that fully automated, well, to an automated inventory of what you actually have. Do you have a way of asking a tool or a system? Did Bob who, uh, is no longer working for the organization. Did Bob create any local accounts within the environment? Mm -hmm. If so, have they been disabled or not? Able. You know, being able to ask that question and be confident in the response mm -hmm. that you're getting is is key. Yeah, That's I mean, it's it, it, it's it, it really comes back to our theme, right? It's all about the communication, making sure every every aspect of the organization communicates when a change occurs and is aware of that change and make sure the appropriate steps are taken, whether it be hiring someone and getting, making sure their access is correct, letting someone go. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example is we had a customer where we found out that uh, there was a vendor who had a, one of his resources had super admin access on the network 
for a completely different aspect of the controls environment. And the reason why he had this aspect because the, the, the facility was in a small town and there are only so many integrators in the small town. When he left one integrator who was the, the part of the super admin level who did all the domain access, he moved to another vendor, but no one ever revoked his access. So now he had both partners, customer, you know, vendors access, and no one thought to ever audit that and say, hey, why does this guy have access to all the aspects of our controls environment? He should only be looking at this specific corner. Well, it's because, well, he moved from company A to company B, and we just never revoked his access. It's amazing how those kind of little anecdotal things right. are, are prevalent. Yeah, policies and procedures are important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have a, a new poll. Sorry about jumping around on the slides. My mouse <laughs> got out of control there for a, for a minute. <laughs> this is an easier poll, just a couple of options. Hopefully it'll give us some visibility into how everyone's doing. While we're doing that, I can add, there's a question in chat. Decommissioning products when they reach the end of their life cycle has been mentioned to us as something that is not happening as often as it should. Yeah. Uh, absolutely a challenge in OT. And it's, and yeah. it's, and it's yeah. determining when something should be decommissioned is always the big challenge. Uh, I'll, I'll pick on the easiest culprit out there, good old Windows 7. Uh, you know, if you look at it from a traditional security perspective, an IT enterprise perspective, unsupporting operating system needs to be off my network as soon as possible, right? If it's no longer supported, get it off, get 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 it updated in this version. From an OT perspective, okay, that's great, but have we looked at the financial impact of upgrading these machines that can be, you know, it's not just upgrading from Windows 7 to Windows 10 to Windows 11, it's literally do we have the licensing for those, which could cost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars for some of these applications, and who's going to accept that that budget impact? So a lot of times we have to extend the life. And, I, and I, like I said, I pick on Windows 7, but I've got customers my who use Windows NT still. I've got one customer using German Windows, uh, German DOS, excuse me, uh, because it was a cost of $33,000 a machine to upgrade the machines that run that that particular <laughs> os so when you look at that impact right it's i think there's always the conversation of you know do we have do we need to be decommissioning these or and i'll use my favorite phrase do we have compensating controls around it yeah. uh you know something when we start talking about that a lot is when i look at these machines if i can mitigate the risk because that's really at the end of the day what we're trying to do here if i can mitigate the risk in some other way that's much more cost impact you know responsible then i'm going to go that way and that's typically what we do in ot right is we try to say okay great i can't get windows 7 off my network but i can put it behind a vpn i can limit the access to this machine i can silo it in its own vlan i can do a lot of other things that mitigate the potential impact of that particular device. Where this becomes a challenge, sorry, Greg, I was, <laughs> where this becomes a challenge is end of life infrastructure issues like switches and firewalls. A little bit different challenge and that's that's really been the bane of a lot of OT operators existence. And I'm sure you got yeah. some color commentating there, Greg. <laughs> well, this is really, as, as, as you said, Scott, this is a cost issue more than anything else, right? The, anymore, you get plenty of advance notice that Windows 7 is no longer going to be supported <laughs> or product XYZ is going to be out of support more than a year from now. You're usually given multiple years so that you have a heads up. And then it's really a question of, you know, what's the best way to mitigate that risk, right? And it depends on what's the criticality of the system. Um, how do we, uh, is there an upgrade path to it or not? Or did the company go out of business? That's a whole other <laughs> challenge that you have to worry about, right? Um, and th there is no perfect answer here, but this is where you get the human brain involved. You have to figure out, all right, we can, we can maintain with the current OS or maintain with the current switches as long as we do XYZ patch or, or what's more likely is, yes, we need to plan this in our maintenance window. The next maintenance window will come up. We have to coordinate with our OEM vendor, make sure that everything is supported by the OEM, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, it looks like we have the poll results. 
I gotta say, this is probably what I would have expected. Yeah. This is this is about what we're seeing. And for those, this is very much where the industry is across almost every OT sector we deal with, very much uh, aligned with what we're seeing. Absolutely, I think that's that's as expected. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the the SOC analyst. Um, if you happen to have a SOC security operations center, then you probably have analysts that are sitting at the at the monitors and reading the monitors and doing their threat hunting and checking out the current and latest and doing all their advanced correlations to see if they can find things within the environment that bad guys can take advantage of, right? Um, they're all about data correlation. You know, so the, the big tool for a SOC analyst is the SIM or, and or a SOAR product, uh, which introduces some automation, orchestration and automation into the, into the, the, the analyst's role. Um, the quality of the SIM is based on the quality of the data that is actually being sent to the SIM. So you want to make sure that it has as, as complete of a picture as possible and that the data has been tuned, as we were talking about earlier, so that you don't get all that white noise added to the SIM. So now your SOC analyst and the SIM has to, itself has to work twice as hard in order to get to that meaningful nugget that's in there to help detect some incident that may be uh, starting up in, in the environment. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, from my perspective, we, I still go back to the old garbage in, garbage out mantra. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so if you've not, you've not refining what data it's ingesting, you, the time to refine it is not at this point. It's before it's ingested, right? So making sure that the data you're getting in is, is accurate, your resources are, your, your sources are reliable, making sure that what you're really trying to do at this level is refine the data and make it actionable, right? Take the data as it's imported in and make sure that I'm seeing what I need to see and that I can take actions on it, right? So that's, to me, the perspective. I think the other part of the SOC analyst is, I think, where I see in OT, the biggest challenge is the incident response component from here. Mm -hmm. Who do yeah. I pick up when I do see an event and I see something that's impacting a Rockwell PLC on this production line, who's what, so what I found is a lot of time, that's where the disconnect in communication occurs because no one knows who to pick up the phone. What's our process? What do we do? A lot of times we have the, all these same processes on the enterprise, but then when it comes to an OT event, we guess. And I think that's where we start to see the biggest value to the analysts is having a good, well-defined, here's my process. Here's my escalation for an incident. And please, please do your IR incident response planning well, everything's nice and calm, <laughs> right? <laughs> everything's going well, great. Let's let's spend some time and do some planning for when things are not so calm and everybody's hair is on fire because that is not the time to figure out who do I call, what do I do? Exactly. In enterprise world, you know, it's very common to take a machine offline to re-image that machine. These are remediation mitigation techniques that you just don't do in the OT space. It's far better to pick up the phone and know who to call, who's that plant manager at that plant so that that plant manager know, who knows that site far better than the SOC analyst can take the appropriate action, right? The SOC analyst is the first line of defense. They can detect things before the plant manager or the plant engineer has visibility into what might be happening. SOC analyst raises the awareness of that plant manager or plant engineer, and then they can figure out what the best mitigation technique may be, if there even is one, other mm -hmm. than maybe just documenting the fact that something's going mm -hmm. on. We're, we're going to live with it. And I, and I think the other aspect of this too is the same tabletop exercises and testing that you do on the enterprise, do the same thing on OT. I think that's where a lot of times we don't, we write a plan and it's literally call Bob the plant manager and that's it. And it's like, that, that, that's not a plan, right? That's, that's, uh, that's simply a phone number. I, you know, walk through the plan, make sure everyone's aware of it, do tabletop exercises. Hey, let's do, let, let's go through this. And Greg, I, I can't emphasize, you said it exactly right, while it's calm. <laughs> don't wait <laughs> don't wait for an event to test your your incident response uh okay we got another question here we go uh how do you deal if you have to develop a new project that design engineering has to comply with iso iec 2719 or NERC, 
but management is not necessarily on board with securing manufacturing or investing in further security processes because of the associated cost, effort, resources. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> that. It's a risk so, management issue, I would say, right? You have to explain what the possible implications are exactly. if things are not done. And then they can actually see some real dollar bills or some real uh, euros that are associated with the cost <laughs> of not doing anything. This is exactly. basically this is basically insurance, you know, you can almost think of, right? It's a it's a cost. It's not uh, it's not a profit center, unfortunately. Security is just not. Nope. But it does. And, and, I, I, and NERC did everyone one big favor, and I, it, it's not always seen this way, is it put teeth to their standard? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Everyone knows the million dollars per day per incident kind of uh, high watermark. And that, it, I think, Greg, you put it exactly right. You know, listen, this is what we risk. Here's what, you, here's what we know it to be the direct cost of implementing such change. Here's the cost if we don't implement the change. So it's 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 not an ROI conversation. It's it's really is a TCO conversation, right? Here's here's our two cost options. How do we measure against each other? Are, are we willing to pay a million dollars per day per incident if we don't do this? And the executive team and and et cetera, they're more in line now with the the concept of risk than they used to be, right? So absolutely, you know, saying breach, saying ransomware, all that. Focus on risk itself, so that they can then put that quantified risk percentage in their head as to, okay, uh, how am I really willing to roll the dice on the brand taking a significant hit and the PR mess that could come from a particular breach? Um, maybe it would be better to spend some money and, and avoid all that. Yeah. And I, and I think last year really did a big benefit to almost everybody in specifically the OT security roles and that we had finally some big publicized incidents. Mm. So that the threat modeling, it came less theoretical and more of here's some practical, you know, JBS, Colonial, uh, you know, we, we, uh, Oldsmar, Florida. We have all these really well-known OT or OT related uh, security incidents with direct costs associated. So we, it's no longer the, the theoretical. It's really here's, here's some organizations that were impacted. I could probably list off a dozen more if you, if you really want to go through do we want to be in the same boat as a lot of these organizations? That's the risk we're taking now. And, and I think when you look at OT, the simplest question I ask, and this is something I continually is, and everyone should, you know, to have some idea of this number is what's it cost us to be down for a minute, for an hour, for a day, right? So when you look at those costs, when you start modeling that it is, if we were down because we were impacted by not doing this change and we were down for a day, are we willing to absorb the loss at, you know, you know, fifty thousand dollars a day, or nine thousand dollars an hour, or whatever it might be. But are we willing to absorb that cost? And now it becomes a, a truly, like Greg said, a risk conversation. Is are we willing to accept that risks, or are we willing to invest X number of dollars to prevent that for the foreseeable future? So yeah. that to me becomes the conversation. And the other aspect of it is too is our job as security professional is is to document, highlight that we've acknowledged the risk, but accept the decision and try to find ways to compensate for whatever the decision is and try to keep always achieving that better that better risk mitigation strategy, really driving that be, but being the vocal proponents of, we should be doing this because I feel as the guy owning security, I don't feel this is acceptable risk. Thanks. So this is a great transition to the executive. <laughs> Perfect one. <laughs> right. So the, the, the executive team, looks at things obviously different than the plant engineer, <clears throat> plant manager, et cetera. <laughs> Excuse me. They're trying to manage the organization, the business as efficiently as possible. They want to maximize profit, minimize cost, and just proceed through the world, getting as much, you know, maximizing the revenue for the organization. Now, in reality, they are beginning to start to worry about cybersecurity because of the risk as we were just talking about. They're looking at external threats, insider risk, right? Insider um, insider threat uh, is a real problem in the, in, in the world and there are all kinds of examples of that that you can Google uh, and business continuity. But I would even add to this bulleted list, maintaining your brand uh, throughout uh, the, the, you know, uh, something, you know, Bad can still happen, and you can, and yet you can. How you respond to a breach 
can actually enhance your brand. And I, I, the thing that pops in my mind is the Norse Hydro uh, ransomware attack that was back in what 2020, I think. Mm -hmm. And and basically, they, they this was the textbook response. The the whole company pitched in. They were fully transparent. Everyone knew what was going on. They did not want to pay that ransomware. They did not pay that ransomware, and everything you know. And they just decided to go back to backups and 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 move on from there. And it was a it was an expensive process to go through because of just because of an email phishing attack. But in the end, for in the cybersecurity world, at least, Norsk Hydro has a much, their brand is, is now elevated because of how they responded to that particular attack. Scott, I don't know if you have anything. No, no, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think it's from an executive team. I think it comes back to the exact same thing we talked about from from the other is when I look at the incident response plan, it should include what's our response as an executive team, right? What are we willing, what is, um, and take ownership of, of driving what our response is. That you, Norsk is a great example of that, right? They took complete ownership of what we're gonna do, what we're not gonna do, and what, what, what this is gonna mean. And while at the time of the event, reputationally they were you know they were under attack and it was hitting them but post event they i don't think their reputation could be stronger they're guys that achieved what they needed they went through an incident they 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 did not they did not allow them to be you know lingering victimhood is the best way i can put it right they did not they're not seen as exposed and i think a lot of times what we see a lot of times with incidents is that first reaction is let's let's hide it let's not let it happen yeah. let's let's yeah. Uh, put up the uh, walls put up the wall yeah yeah that's like, right yeah yeah exactly it's getting to siege mode and, yeah uh, and, and, I, and i'll give you another example of a, a pretty uh, and this is from a slightly different perspective but i was very proud of the way fire i handled their incident when it happened uh, th uh through the solar winds attack right yeah. they were very open with everybody they communicated here's what's happened here's how we got exposed we had tools out and you know it, it was it was the right response because he communicated what happened what are the recourses? What was at risk? And everybody was able to formulate the right appropriate follow-up action from that. So there's, a, you look at the history of events on that, and I, I, I don't want to necessarily embarrass, but there's a, a quite a few examples of people who didn't go that way. Right. Uh, who, who, and, 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 and the other, it, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and I think that's really key. Really, I mean, just really, really understanding what your role is and really, what we're going to do in case of event. I think that's what people need to think through. Yeah. And I, you know, I know we're running short on time. If not, we're out of time, but if you're, yeah. <laughs> if you're able to maintain and, and hang in there, we're, you know, one more slide, I think, and, and yeah. we're done. If we could just quickly run through this poll, then I'll, we'll, we'll wrap things up. And while that poll is, is still out there, I, I move to the next slide. And this is this is basically an all-encompassing slide that talks about the different roles and the different types of cybersecurity elements that we've been discussing this whole time, right? And how that which which role is is going to be focused on which capability. Um, and it's an interesting table, and it, it it just brings again a different viewpoint to the different roles within the organization. And, and we'll, be, we'll be sharing this, this slide and we're actually the deck um, after the, after the uh, webinar concludes with everyone so that everybody can, can see. And I, I, I like this, this slide because it, it does, and, you know, depending on who I happen to be talking with, I can very quickly get a, a good glimpse of, you know, what are they focusing on? Because they uh, may, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, and I'd also take away, if you're in one of these roles, I would also see this as an opportunity to collaborate with the people mm -hmm. who also have the same task, right? So if I'm a plan engineer and I want to look at vulnerability reporting, I want to go talk to my compliance team. I want to talk to my operations team, IT operations team. I think yeah. those are, if I'm looking at a, a, a chances to open up those dialogues, you're now seeing who, what the, everyone kind of touches on so that you know that the, they're going to have the same investment into the same category so getting a path of communication open will be critical right okay i think we have our last slide right yeah okay 
poll results are in. Biggest challenges facing your security program, vulnerability management's top gun right now. That's interesting. And patch management zero. Yeah, interesting. interesting. So yeah, um, vulnerability management is a key uh, element to any cybersecurity program. Just knowing what vulnerabilities you happen to have, you can choose to mitigate any number of ways. We've talked about this. It could be just a documentation effort. It could be, um, you know, scheduling a patch in the next maintenance window and making sure that it's been approved by the vendor, et cetera. Um, Scott, I don't know if you have any. No, I, I mean, absolutely. So I, I, I continually talk to customers and I think the biggest challenge we throw at is vulnerability management in the sense that every day a new vulnerability gets released every day you don't know which one's going to be the next big thing and if you can't find a way to automate and streamline that process it's only going to become more and more cumbersome as time goes on because we're not seeing fewer vulnerabilities we're seeing more it's it's that steady hockey stick right we're seeing more and more uh, uh, vulnerabilities disclosed and so you're constantly be chasing your tail if you're if you're only waiting for that alert to come out and then and then try to figure out okay where am i impacted how do i deal with uh, log4j or how do I deal with DICOM vulnerability or whatever the next one might be it's always going to be a little bit of a a, a a frantic you know fire drill if you don't have a vulnerability management program in place right. so we you know as we've talked throughout the whole webinar know your assets know your configurations automate that process to take out the human error element and to make sure you're dealing with the most current data throughout you know for whatever uh project you happen to be working on as vulnerability detections or patching etc um without that fully automated current view of your configuration and your ot environment it, it it's it, it's not it's not being as productive as you could be let's just say mm -hmm. All right. I think that's it. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, Cyber Senate would like to thank Industrial Defender uh, for supporting this webinar and joining us, and Gray Matter uh, for uh, joining them and us uh, on this important discussion. Sure seems like there's a, a lot more we can do with data. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, this discussion and, and, and how many out there in the industrial world actually have their eye on data. I mean, there's a monitoring issue. Who, who's watching that data and, uh, you know, and, and keeping an eye on it and, and extrapolating this, uh, this gold mine uh, where, where, where there are elements that we could use for security resilience. So Great conversation and uh, some good questions along the way too. Thank you, gentlemen, for for answering those so proactively. And uh, I know that you'll both be available through the Industrial Defender team. Um, this uh, webinar was recorded. Uh, I know the slides are going to be available. The recording will be available, um, and all of our attendees that are that are listening in here, you can uh, access those through the Industrial Defender team who um, will no doubt be in touch with you or just simply get in touch with us here at the Cyber Senate. But on behalf of all of us and, uh, and the industrial control sector, which we uh, need to work uh, much harder at securing, especially in these days and times, uh, uh, having subject matter experts like uh, you folks join us uh, to have these important discussions is, is something we need to do more often. Um, so thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, that does conclude today's webinar with Industrial Defender. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.